Let's just pray as we uh, come around the word then. Lord, once again, I thank you for the, for the privilege and for the opportunity of being able to unpack and to share your word this morning. As always, Lord, I, I pray that you would open the, the, the mind to receive, the heart to receive. That you would work over the soil of our life, Lord, so that we are ready to receive the seed of your word that it would be embedded into us, would take root in us, would grow in us, and would pollinate elsewhere. And as always, Lord, any error is mine. All glory, all honour is yours. In your name we pray. Amen. Sometimes it's really, in fact most, most weeks I come here and I sit and I wait for somebody to do communion and you know sometimes we have long periods of silence, sometimes somebody comes up quicker and, and all the rest of it. But what always fascinates me is nobody here knows what I'm talking about today and nobody knows what, where I've gone with the preparation of the message. But what I often find is that there will be something which is said in communion which resonates with the message which is going to come today. And that, that encourages me because, let's be honest, I spend an awful lot of time trying to be as diligent as possible to serve you and I get nothing for it. And I don't do it for something, but it's sometimes when I'm sitting there 12 hours, 15 hours, and I think I've got so much to do in life. And am I wasting my time? You know? Am I just wasting my time? Am I just pushing stuff out that people don't want to hear? Or if they do hear it, all they want to do is argue with it anyway. Um, and, and I have these conversations with God all the time. Saying, really Lord, am I just wasting my time doing this? Because it seems to me that sometimes I am. And so when I sit, and so every communion, I sit and I listen. And I would say that 99 times out of the 100, the communion inspires me. Because it's like God going, crack on, crack on. Because these people are on a similar page. If they're not on the same page, they're on a similar page. And keep going. So thank you. Which is why I wait for communion. I'm not doing communion in this church. This is for you guys to do. Um, it's great. And I love seeing you do it. So, all of that said, we will now get on with this parable. And we will wrap this parable up today. So you're going to be pleased to know that. So we've only gone for three lessons in this parable, which is great. It's only three verses. And we've managed to stretch it out over three weeks. We're still tracking through it then. And it's this parable on the creditor and the debtors. And we've got to that third message. So hopefully today... We will get it done. Uh, and so in order to help us understand what Jesus has been teaching here, we've spent time over these last few weeks, and I appreciate we had a break last week when, uh, when Shane was speaking, but we've spent time over these last few weeks looking at what I've called the bookends, the first bookend, then we've looked at the parable itself, and now in this third part, we're moving to the last bookend. So that's the bit that then closes off the whole story. Bookend here, parable here, closes off the story and so that first bookend sits in verses 36 to 40 of, of Luke uh, chapter 7 and gives us the contextual setting to where the parable then leads into the last bookend which we're going to look at today sits at verses 44 to 50 and then that little three verse parable that we looked at last time just is sandwiched in the middle of those two very important events that were going on and, and as I said, this is, this is the only parable that gives us an absolute, clear, contextual setting. None of the other parables are as clear as this. So there's something in that, and which, we did, which is why I've spent a bit of time trying to get onto it. So we come to the closure of the whole thing, get to verse 44. So before we start to get into the weave of it all, what we're going to do is going to read through this whole piece. 
First bookend, parable, last bookend. Read through it. It goes like this then. Luke 7, 36 to 50. Now, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. And so he went into the Pharisee's house and he took his place at the table. Then, when a woman of that town, who was a sinner, learned that Jesus was dining at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfumed oil. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfumed oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know, what, what, uh, he would know who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. And so Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. Well, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other 50. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this one? I entered your house. You gave me no feet from you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but from the time I entered, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Thus she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What a great story. What a great story. You can see that that little parable is just lost in the middle of those two great events either side of it. Sweet. Anyway, so, so far in the story then, we've identified that the parable was told to a Pharisee, and the Pharisee's name was Simon, and this guy had invited Jesus over to his house to have a bite to eat. And at this meal, and while Jesus was reclining at the table there, a woman, who was most likely um, a prostitute, uh, comes in, and stands by at the foot of the guests. This is the spot where the servants would stand. And it was the servants' duties to, to wash the feet of the guests as they reclined. Now, as we know, it's quite possible that Simon the Pharisee had actually invited Jesus over to lunch in order to get to know him better, in order to better understand his teaching. So it's quite feasible that Jesus was actually in the middle of teaching, having some discourse, as this woman came in, took her place, and who, hearing his words as he was speaking, was moved to tears. And as she begins weeping, she, she bends down and, and she wipes his feet with her, her hair and then begins kissing his feet and, and, and then cracks open this, this perfumed ointment and she begins to bathe his feet with this ointment. And you can just imagine, you know, the crying cutting across that conversation there. That the sobbing woman, her actions then become a real focal point of attention to everybody else. As that waft of the perfume fills the air around everybody. And I said to, said to you time and time, just immerse yourself in this. Imagine yourself being sat there. The sounds, the, the noise of servants moving around, the, the clatter of crockery, the, the wafts, the smells, all of this sort of stuff. Place yourself there. And everyone there is now transfixed on this woman and transfixed on what she's doing. And Jesus, as, he's, as this is happening, he's looking around and he's watching people and he's watching every tut, tut, tut. He's watching every mm, oh, 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 dreadful, oh, very bad. What's this woman doing here? Oh, shouldn't have her like in here. You know? He's watching all of this go on. He's taking it all in. And once he's seen enough of all of these reactions from people, and we've all been there, haven't we? Have you ever sat somewhere? I, I mean, I've had it, actually, at the Presbyterian Church here. Um, I walked up to the Presby Church. 
should I name and shame them? No, maybe I shouldn't. But anyway, I did. I walked up to the Presbyterian Church. It's quite, quite, quite hilarious. I walked up to the Presby Church when we first arrived in Amberley. I've got my hat on, I've got my jandals on, I've got my shorts on, I've got my earrings in, I've unshaven. And I come strolling up there on the Sunday. And there was a couple of old guys that stood at the door, booted and suited. And they stood there. And as I walked up, they went... <laughs> and gave me that once up and down and everybody at some point in their life will have seen this sort of thing or will have done it to somebody even if you haven't done it physically you may have thought it if we're honest we've all done oh goodness me who were they and this was the look I got you've got the long hair I, I had long hair at the time yeah yeah I've got the long hair I've got the earrings anyway all of that so we know what it's about. And Jesus is watching these reactions. Nobody has to say anything for you to see it on someone's face that they, they just don't like what you look like. We give ourselves away a lot, don't we, by the way that we look? Don't we? And Jesus is sitting there. And once he's seen enough of this, he tells Simon he's got something to say to him. And Simon, being the good Pharisee that he is, says, teach on, teacher. Teach on, tell me, tell me, I'm all ears. I want to hear what you say. And so Jesus does so. Jesus does so. And we looked at that little parable, didn't we, in verses 41 to 43. Guts of the parable is that both debtors had their debts wiped clean by the creditor. And as a result, Jesus says to Simon, so tell me, Simon, which one of those debtors is going to love the creditor more? The one with much to wipe clean, or the one with less to wipe clean? And we see that Simon gives the right answer, don't we? He goes, well, the one with the most to wipe clean is likely to be the most grateful. Now, those present would have seen how Jesus placed and aligned his listeners into the story. Because this was a study in contrasts. This was between a righteous Pharisee and a woman of ill repute. So we've got these two players here, the righteous Pharisee and the woman of ill repute. And the answer that given by Simon would likely have made the folk that were sitting around the table nearly want to choke on their food. Probably would. When we understand this, the creditor is understood as God. God is the creditor. He's the one that we owe everything to. The one with the fewer debts when we're putting people into the story, would have been likened to Simon the Pharisee. The one with the greater debt would have been linked to this woman of ill repute. So by giving the answer that we see Simon give, he actually acknowledges that the woman of ill repute would have loved God more than the righteous Pharisee. A prostitute would have loved God more than a righteous Pharisee. So little wonder that folk around him would have gone, sorry, I'm just choking on my hors d'oeuvres here, yeah? or, or my horse's doofers, as uh, they're called somewhere else. A prostitute loving God more than a ritually pure Pharisee who esteemed purity over so many other things. Understand, understand the Pharisees, understand the, 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 the culture here. I was reading something this week that, that really does, it certainly drilled home to me anyway, in terms of shock value, what this sort of thing would have done. You see, the Pharisees get a real bad rap in many places in the Bible, don't they? Well, they certainly do in, in the way that we interpret what they're saying. And I'm not sure that that's always fair. I'm not sure. The Pharisees were a bunch of people who were set, whose heart's intent was to draw Israel back to God. That's what they wanted more than anything. They wanted to draw Israel back to God. You know, Jesus' teaching aligns with the Pharisaical teaching more places than any other sect of Judaism, just as an aside. So they wanted to draw Israel back to God. Um, I've got a book that I'm reading at the moment uh, by N.T. Wright and a chap called Michael Bird. And it is a remarkable book. It's, it's huge. It's a remarkable book. It's called the, the New Testament in its World. And about the Pharisees, it says this. The Pharisees were not a separatist religious club. Rather, they were a Jewish renewal movement seeking to draw Israel towards the conditions that would hasten its restoration before God and its elevation over the surrounding nations. The Pharisaic agenda then 
was to purify Israel by summoning the people to return to the true ancestral traditions, to restore Israel to its independent theocratic status, and to be, as a pressure group, in the vanguard of such a movement through the study and the practice of Torah. The Pharisees aimed to demonstrate in the present time that they were the ones whom Israel's God would vindicate when, as expected, he acted to rescue his people. A group, a group who were wanting to purify Israel and who would then be seen as the ones who the God of Israel would then vindicate. The Pharisees, the ones who the God of Israel would then vindicate. So when we have this understanding of what their agenda was, we then see a Pharisee, someone who God would vindicate, openly acknowledge, as he recognises in Jesus' teaching, that a prostitute loves God more than a Pharisee. Can, can you just see these tensions that have been going on here at the time? And I wonder if at that point the other folk at the table wouldn't have thought something like, hang about a minute, hang about a minute, Simon. He's eating a bit too much cheese He's eating a bit too much cheese here and he's clearly lost his marbles. Um, Surely this can't be right. Surely this can't be right. Pharisee, prostitute. Mm, Doesn't work. Doesn't work like this. So not only was the issue around the purity of the Pharisees at stake here, there was also a very clear tier of social privilege that was active at this time in the ancient Near East. Very clear stratas nice and simple first we have the ruling elite we have the ruling elite and their immediate family and their dependents second we've got the regional elites which were things like royal officials wealthy business owners leading military figures or those who owned land big landowners and they made their income from it third we then had the municipal elites smaller business owners uh, smaller landowners uh, small holdings and things like that And those who served in the military or in officialdom, but were now retired and out of that service. Fourth, we then had folk like the scribes, the priests, and other lower level government retainers. Fifth, we come to the skilled workers, the artisans, builders, stonemasons, silversmiths. Sixth, we move into the peasant class, which is the unskilled labourers. And then we get to the seventh, and this covers off the destitute. And this seventh strata includes beggars, widows, prostitutes, disabled, orphans, sick, infirm, such as lepers, and anyone else who is deemed unclean. Where does this woman sit on the social strata? We're talking pretty low in the food chain, right? Pretty low in the food chain. This woman is right down there in the strata of civilised society. Surely, Jesus, Simon had got his answer wrong. And so all eyes turned to Jesus with a very big expectation that he's probably going to correct Simon's misunderstanding here. And what does Jesus do? Jesus commends him for getting it right. You have judged rightly. Well done, Simon. Uh, And so now that Jesus has secured the agreement of his host as to what this actually means... He then goes on to make some further pointed comments. I don't necessarily think this is to have a dig at Simon. I think it was a way of actually sealing and securing the statement and the judgment that Simon had actually just articulated. So that's what we're going to look at and see how that plays out. And how Jesus then brings this whole little story to a close in the following verses. So in that verse 44, then turning toward woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but from the time I entered, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. Thus she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who are at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So do you remember uh, I mentioned about a deployment of a very typical rabbinical tool of teaching, which was like a study in contrast, and how getting the audience 
that Jesus is talking to, to actually see themselves in the story becomes a really great way then of, of unpacking really deep truths of God through really common themes. So Jesus grabs these deep truths of God and presents them in common themes that everyone can understand. And we've met some of these contrasts and things like that in our previous parables. The wise man versus the foolish man. The new wineskin versus the old wineskin. The good soil versus the bad soil. The forgiving master versus the unforgiving uh, servant. The obedient son versus the disobedient son. And this, in this little parable, we could add another two sets of contrasts between the two debtors. The one who owes much and the one who owes less. And then aligning of these characters with a righteous Pharisee and a woman of ill repute. And you look at the contrast that Jesus plays out over those verses. No water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears. No kiss of greeting, but from the time I entered, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. But she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Contrasts. All of these contrasts tracking all the way through. Now, it would be really easy for us here to sit, 21st century, Western, white European, predominantly people steeped in Christendom, etc., etc., 1700 years of church history. It would be really easy for us to sit here and to scorn the Pharisee for what he hasn't done. And when I looked at many of the commentaries, that's what it's about. Oh, the Pharisees should have done this, and they should have done that. No, that. We actually missed the point. We missed the point of the whole story if we go down that track. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with what Simon has done or hasn't done. It goes beyond that. First up, the fact that Simon didn't provide water to wash Jesus' feet wouldn't have been seen as an insult. Wouldn't have been seen as an insult at all. Why was that? Because it wasn't down to the host to provide water for foot washing. It was down to the servants of the host. It wasn't down to Simon. There would have been no expectation in that culture for the host himself to wash the feet of the guests. In fact, the pointed comment that Jesus makes, you gave me no water, would actually have been more shocking. Well, why would he give you water? Why would you say that to him? It's not down to him, it's down to them. That would have been more shocking. It wasn't something that the host did. The host did not do that. But there were lessons that can be learned from it. The, f- the first noting of foot washing tracks all the way back into Genesis. It goes right back to Genesis. When Abraham was sat there and he sat under that, uh, the oak tree at Mamre and he sees these three men coming up and Abraham runs from the entrance of his tent, bows to them, asks them to stay a, stay a while. We aren't told who he talks to, but he says this, eight, Genesis eighteen seventeen: Let a little water be brought so that you may all wash your feet and rest under the tree. That's the very first mention. So Abraham has this water brought out for the foot washing. Jesus, later on, doesn't summon someone to bring water, but he does something a tad different, doesn't he, at the Passover meal. We read about that in John's Gospel, John's 18, 5 to 8. He, that is Jesus, poured water into the wash basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel that he'd wrapped around himself. And then he said to Simon Peter, uh, then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand after these things. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. He was the host. Hosts don't do that. Peter was horrified that Jesus was going to wash his feet and that of those around him because this was not the way it was done this was the job of a servant this was not the job of the host was it unusual for a teacher to give a practical illustration of service like this in terms of what jesus did there at passover probably not probably not there is some later rabbinical tradition that uh, around that great rabbi gamaliel And Gamaliel does a similar thing when he starts to serve all of his disciples at a banquet that they're at. And they protest. No, master, no, 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 you mustn't serve us. You mustn't do that. But Gamaliel goes, well, there's someone greater than me that served. And what he does is he pushes all the way back to Genesis. And he goes, Abraham. Abraham served, you see. And there's someone so much greater than Abraham. And then what he does is he pushes it a step back further and he pushes it all the way back to God. 
And he says, God serves because God provides food for the creation as an act of service. And so in God, we see the most sublime illustration of what it actually means to serve. And this is why I have a little bit of a problem, I think, in some churches. Some churches miss the point when we look to reenact washing of folks' feet. Because it wasn't the act of foot washing that was important. It is the principle that foot washing represents. Serving others. That's what it represents. It's about serving others. So, churches, rather than presenting an exercise where they can all do that and pat themselves on the back for having followed the example of Jesus by by foot washing all of the congregation, ought to actually look at the principle of this. And the principle is serve people. Don't wash their feet. Serve people. Serve people in whatever shape or form that takes in the 21st century. Serve people. Don't wash my feet. Meet my needs. Don't wash my feet. Support me and serve me with your finances. Don't wash my feet. Actually, help me put some food on my table. Don't wash my feet. Stand with me when I'm in a time of need. So don't look on Simon's failure to wash the feet as a snub. I don't think that's the point that Jesus is getting at. I do find it interesting that in Exodus 30, 19 to 21, we've got some very clear rules that are laid out for priests. And the priests need to wash their hands and their feet on entering the tabernacle or before approaching the altar of burnt offering. So basically, that means that this needs to happen before they embark on any priestly duty. They have to wash their hands and their feet. And here we have Jesus being washed by an impure woman as he goes about what is eventually recognised in the writings of the New Testament as his priestly duties. Hebrews 4 um, notes this, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathising with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace wherever, whenever we need help. Confidence to approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. I think it's really interesting, the detail here, that this woman, she dries her feet with his hair, which is actually symbolic. It's symbolic of grief, of gratefulness, of pleading, or in propitiation of a God. That's what drying, using your hair to dry somebody's feet was all lined up with. So is what this woman found as she, as she washed and she dried the feet of this rabbi from Nazareth, did she find relief from grief? Did she find gratefulness, mercy and the grace that she now needed to live her life and give her purpose and give her direction? I think it's likely. And then we have that other contrast. No kiss of greeting. But the woman hasn't stopped kissing Jesus' feet. Why did Jesus mention this? The kiss was seen as a symbol of devotion. It was seen as a symbol of devotion between a teacher and their disciple. Particularly between a disciple and a teacher when that teacher had impacted their lives in some way, shape or form. When you think about that, it makes that kiss of Judas... A little bit more poignant, doesn't it? A symbol of devotion. A symbol of impact. But in the case of Simon, was Jesus pointing out that while having been invited over to teach, he wasn't actually respected by Simon in the way that he should have been? You see, there are many folk, aren't there, who are really intrigued by Jesus, perhaps like Simon. 
perhaps just like Simon was, really intrigued by Jesus. Or those that respect Jesus for his moral and his ethical teaching. But they don't actually go far enough. They don't go far enough and respect him for who he is. God incarnate. God in human form. You know, I love that quote by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. And I know that the there's a philosophical argument around whether you know whether it's right, whether it's wrong. It's called Lewis's Trilemma. But I really like the way that it's written in his book Mere Christianity. And C.S. Lewis says this, I'm trying to, here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or... You can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Jesus is so much more than just a good moral teacher or someone to just have a healthy respect for. He's all that and some. He claimed to be God in flesh. He either was or he wasn't. One day, we will all find out. But back to the scripture. In contrast to Simon, who didn't give him the kiss of greeting, this woman kissed his feet. Now, this is a pretty common mark of respect, actually. A common mark of reverence for rabbis. Rabbis who are considered to be right up there in the pecking order. There's a story about Rabbi Jonathan... Rabbi Jonathan had an old man approach him as he walked through the promenade. And, and this chap, this, this old guy, was somebody that the rabbi had actually assisted in getting financial support out of his son. Why you'd have to drag financial support out of your son for an ageing parent, I don't know, but that's a different matter. And so the old guy who got this financial support um, goes down on his knees and he, and he kisses the feet of the rabbi. You know, it wasn't something that was unusual. Equally, it was also seen as a display of gratitude by somebody who had been rescued from a severe penalty in law. So, if someone was up in court and they were facing a death sentence and they were subsequently acquitted of that and they got off it, the accused may well then kiss the feet of the person or the persons that they consider to have been responsible for, the, for pushing out their very successful defence. It's a sign of deep gratitude a sign of heartfelt gratitude. It's a sign of being rescued from a severe penalty. It's not just an intellectual curiosity of studying contrasts here. Jesus goes further and he draws those contrasts out with Simon, doesn't he? Goes a little bit further and he goes, what about the anointing? He didn't anoint my head with oil. But, but this woman, she's anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Again, so we've got to understand the Jewish understanding here of anointing. Anointing, in the Judaic understanding, stands for greatness. Someone who was anointed was somebody who was great. So we end up with that, um, touch not my anointed, means don't get your hands off the great ones. So the anointed ones are the great ones. So the word anointing is this word masha, and linguistically, it's linked to the, to the Hebrew word Moshiach, Messiah. Masha, Moshiach. Masha, Moshiach. And so we see in this little parable, in this little section of the story, that we have 
the Mashiach, Messiah, being Masha, anointed. So you get this Hebraic play of words going on. The earliest Old Testament usage of, of that word Mashiach, Messiah, which links to anointing, is always connected to the name of God. Yahweh, Mashiach, God's anointed. Yahweh, Yashiach, Mashiach, God's anointed, the ruling sovereign one. There's loads of examples of this. I've just picked a few. 1 Samuel 2.10, he will strengthen his king and exalt the power of his anointed one. Yahweh Mashiach, his anointed one. 1 Samuel 2.35, then I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest. He'll do what is in my heart and soul. I'll build for him a lasting dynasty and he'll serve my chosen one. Yahweh Mashiach, my chosen one for all time. Psalm 1850, he gives his king magnificent victories. He's faithful to his chosen ruler, to David and his descendants forever. His chosen ruler, it's the same thing. So, so when you see this played out with the Pharisees, with the prostitute, with all these people watching on, all of these steps that have happened with this woman who's right down here on the bottom of the rung of the social ladder, think about the symbolization, what this sim- symbolically means, the symbolism of this in the, in, in the culture of anointing. Think about it. The anointing of the high priest consecrated him over and above his countrymen, enlisted him into God's service, and gave him immediate access to the presence of God. Think about that. The anointing of the king gave him the title Yahweh Mashiach, God's anointed. And it placed him in a really special relationship to God, establishing him as the one who God had chosen to represent his rulership over Israel, and as the one who would bear witness of God's glory before all the nations. Think about the symbology that this little act that this woman is doing from priesthood to kingdom. Think about everything that's being wrapped up there. The actions of this woman were so symbolic, not in anointing Jesus for burial, but in declaring that he was the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah of God, Yahweh Mashiach, the one who had been enlisted into God's service to give immediate access to the presence of God, the one who God had chosen to represent his rulership, not just over Israel, but the one who would bear witness of God's glory before all the nations. Oh, can't, this is amazing. This is amazing what this woman is doing. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's being done from the lowest common denominator upwards. Little bonus for you here. Not only is this the first of three dinners that Jesus ate with the Pharisees, this woman is the first person noted in Luke's Gospel who is recorded at being at the feet of Jesus. And my challenge to you is track through Luke's Gospel and see where being at the feet of Jesus ends. But she's the first person. She kicks something off right down here which is incredible. And so all of this that's going on in between the telling of the parable, all of the setting, all of the scene, everything that's going on here adds a little bit of right back at you to the thought of Simon that he had at the beginning. Don't know if any of you remember the thought that Simon had back at the beginning, but it was noted in Luke 7.39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said, if this man were a prophet... That was the thought. If this, and Jesus is like, hang about, right back at you, mate. Look what's going on here. Look what's happened. We've had this, we've had this, we've had this. Bang. Now this could be rendered, if this man were the prophet, i.e. the long-awaited for prophet in the pattern of Moses, the one who would deliver Israel and restore them. And here, sat at this table, things were being played out. The symbolism was so rich. I wonder if it was lost on him. I wonder if it was lost on him. Having outlined all of the contrast, that narrative continues, doesn't it? Therefore, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Thus she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. Therefore, therefore, because of 
All she has done, all of these actions that she's carried out, think about everything that she's done, from the weeping, from the hair, from the anointing, from everything that she's done, because of all of these things that she's done, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. No John Bunyan's sinner's prayer there in altar call, is there? Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And then blow me. The very next verse. He turns around to her. He looks at her and says, Your sins are forgiven. Now, verse 49 in modern parlance, would it start with, what? What? Or WT something. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. What? That's how I imagine verse 49 to start. Because if the folk had been choking on Simon's response, they would have now needed somebody to come up to them and do the <coughs> Heimlich manoeuvre on them to stop them from dying after listening to Jesus' response. Who does this man think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Who do you think you are? Only God can forgive sins. You see, earlier on in the book, haven't we, in Luke 5, 17 to 26, there's this lovely section of, of a miracle that Jesus does where a paralytic is lowered through the roof and he's plonked there by his mates in front of Jesus and uh, having carried out the, the miracle and healed him, Jesus says, oh, by the way, yeah, your sins are forgiven as well. And they have a fit. Luke 5, 21. And then the experts in the law and the Pharisees, and who's Jesus dining with? Then the experts in the law and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who is this man who is uttering blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God can forgive sins. This is the divine prerogative, right? And it's, it's true. Only God can forgive sins. So Jesus was either a fruitcake or he was God. This is the double whammy that would have whacked home, nailed things home for Simon. Simon, mate, the prophet, forget about the prophet. Not only am I the anointed, chosen one, the Messiah, as demonstrated by the actions of this woman, but I am on a par with God because I forgive sins. Powerful. What's going on in this little story? And the woman has been saved by her faith. She hasn't been saved by her tears. She hasn't been saved by the gifts that she poured over him. She hasn't been saved by any form of conduct. There is no work that you or I can do to attain salvation. It was her faith that saved her. The outward expression of the inner working of love. And the many tears that may have separated her from this community of Israel were now washed away. She should, in keeping with Pharisaic understanding at the time, she should now be embraced by the community of faith and completely restored into fellowship with them. That's what they wanted. That's what they were looking for. That table around Jesus should now have been resounding and rejoicing for this woman. Once separated, now back in the fold. Once lost, now found. We aren't told that it was happening and kicking off like that round the table. But we're also not told that it wasn't. What we see here, I think, is we see a wonderful story of the extent of the grace of God and the love of God and the acceptance by God of any who come to him and who fall at his feet. The lowest strata of civilised society. God goes, I'm on your level and I'll meet with you down here. We have an amazing God, right? We have an amazing God. In the West, we sit in a bubble. 
not just a COVID-19 bubble. But we sit in a bubble around our tiny little bit of the world that insulates us from the reality of life across the whole of this globe. We sit in our societies, we listen to all sorts of debates about all sorts of things that across the broad swathe of humanity are completely meaningless. In our culture, we've had a little mirror placed in front of us. And we've been told to look into that mirror because what we see in that mirror is what the world revolves around. It's all about me. And you know what? We've bought into this lie. Not only in our societies, but in our churches. It's all about me. I come to church to get my ears tickled. I come to church so you can tell me how right I am. I come to church to feel good. I come to church because I need encouragement. I come to church because... Because... It's all about me. Just as there are no works that this woman could do to attain salvation, no tears, no gifts, no conduct, none of this is about us. Just telling you a little secret. None of this is about us. This world is not about us. None of it is about us. It is all about about God and it is all about how God has stepped into our time and our space in the person of Jesus and how God wants to reconcile folk back to himself and then what he's done to achieve that he's provided his body called the church to do it his body where he meets with the lowest common denominator called the church. And I think if we remember it's all his in the beginning, we're not going to go very far wrong. John Ruskin writes, the root of almost every schism and heresy from which the Christian church has suffered has been because of the effort of men to earn rather than receive their salvation. And the reason preaching is so commonly ineffective is that it often calls on people to work for God rather than letting God work through them. You see, our duty here on planet Earth, especially as folk who profess Jesus as Lord and as Saviour, is to faithfully represent him, to mirror him in the community in which we live. To let God then work through us. And this means extending grace, it means extending mercy to those whose sins are many and recognising that each one of us can come unstuck. Particularly if we sit in a camp where we think that we're pretty good folk and we haven't got that much to be forgiven of. Because we need to be careful. It's then that our love of God will run lukewarm and our love and our grace and our mercy that we're supposed to show towards others will also diminish. Remember, each one of us has been forgiven much. Whether you think you have or not, you have been forgiven much. So each one of you, each one of us, should love much. Love God, love others, and in doing so, serve this world by bringing the reality of Jesus to people around us. Be the church that you are called to be. Be the church that you're called to be. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, I 
thank you that you have entrusted us with mirroring you. We may do it very, very opaquely at the best of times, but thank you so much for the chance that you've given us anyway. And my prayer, Lord, is that you would touch the lives of all of your folk here today, or those that listen to this later on, wherever they are, so that they may begin to reflect you well in the society in which we live. <coughs> We're not supposed to pull ourselves out of this world. We're supposed to engage with things going on in this world. There's a lot of nonsense in it. We know that. And we also know that the church isn't immune to buying into that nonsense. So I pray that you give us wisdom and that you give us good sense to actually see things with your eyes so that we may faithfully follow your leading. And I pray that you would go with your folk today, Lord. Guard them, guide them, protect them as they head into this new week. We honour you, we love you, and may we carry you well into this world. And in your name we pray. Amen.